Hi, boys and girls, this is Brave Harriet. It's a strange thing to see an aeroplane fly. The thing is so gawky and bumbling on the ground, so spindly and flimsy looking. But then, once in the air, it soars with grace and beauty of a hawk strong enough to lift a person high above the trees and into the clouds. I hadn't grown up wishing to be a pilot because there were no planes when I was a girl, but once I saw one, I knew where I belonged. There at the controls with blue sky all around me, the day I saw my first plane, eager for my chance to be alone in my own great bird, my friends thought I was crazy. There I was already a successful newspaper writer, why would I risk my life in such a rattletrap, gum and spit contraption? But to me, there was no reason to be afraid, only a reason to soar among the first high up in the clouds. And that first time I flew solo, it was as if I had finally found where I belonged. I didn't have to think about what to do. My body just knew. It was like I'd grown wings from my shoulders. Flying felt so natural. But it didn't seem natural to the licensing board when I applied for my pilot's license. No woman has ever received a license to fly, the official told me gruffly. You mean no woman has yet, I replied. I went on to pass not one, but two flight tests, cutting figure eights perfectly around two test pylons. And, I admit, it was very satisfying to see that official's face again as he handed me my license. The next day, I was already flying air shows, barnstorming, we called it, doing loop-the-loops, wing-walking, and flying around Staten Island by the light of the full moon. But it wasn't enough. I wanted more. That's when I decided to do it, to become the first woman to fly solo across the English Channel. Now, even other pilots thought I was crazy. Gustav Hamill, who had flown the English Channel by himself, didn't think I could do it. Harriet, dear, he said, but I didn't feel very dear at all. This foolishness could be the death of you. It's beastly cold. You'll see nothing but blasted fog, and you'll only have a compass to guide you. I'm not afraid, I said calmly, and I have a good compass. But you understand that if you are off by a mere five miles, you'll end up over the North Sea and never be heard from again. It happened to a fellow just a few days ago. I can use the compass. I insisted. Gustav frowned and looked at his shoes, but he didn't give up. Look here, he persisted. You can have the glory without the danger. Here's my plan. I'll dress up in your purple cloak and hood so no one can see my face. And pretending to be you, I'll fly the channel for you. We'll meet in France, switch clothing, and places, and you'll fly the short bit to Calais to be greeted with a hero's welcome. I couldn't imagine a worse course of events. A hero's welcome for a fraud? No, thank you. You may be worried about what I can do, but I'm not. And that was the last time Gustav tried to stop me. My mind was set on what I had to do, and even he could see that. Instead, he came with me to Dover to see me off. Monday, April 15, 1912 was the day set for my flight. But as the sun dawned, the wind gusted, and the fly churned with rain clouds, my little aeroplane would have been torn apart like a kite. So I waited and waited and wondered, was I doing the right thing? By dawn the next day, the skies were clear and calm, and I felt as sure as ever that I could do this. I could hang suspended between air and water, and it would feel right. I just knew it. Before I got into my plane, Gustav handed me a hot water bottle to tie around my waist. Remember, it's cold up there, he said, frowning. Thank you, Gustav, I smiled. I can't wait to find out for myself. As I climbed into the cockpit, Gustav joined the six other men straining to hold down my plane. It had no brakes, so they kept me on the ground by pulling on the wheels and tail while I started the engine. I adjusted my goggles, held my compass tightly, and gave them a thumbs up. The men let go, and the plane bumped into the air. I was off. At 5.35 a.m., my plane left England's soil, heading over the cliffs of Dover, across the channel, and on to France. It was my first time to fly by compass. It was my first time to fly over water, and it was my first time to cross the English Channel. The crossing was all I had imagined it to be. The blue overhead, the blue underneath, the blue all around. 
below me i could see a tugboat full of reporters following my path then they disappeared as i was wrapped in a thick mist the blue was gone and there was nothing to see but white a cold wet whiteness like a, the foam of a wave by six o'clock my goggles had clouded up so i pushed them up on my forehead without them i still saw only whiteness i should have been terrified but oh it was so beautiful as much a part of flying as being in the vast clear blue and i had my compass to guide me all i had to do was follow the path east and trust my plane to do the rest by 6 30 however i was so cold i could scarcely feel my own hands the white fog had crept into my bones and i worried i would not stay alert and so would miss my compass heading the plane suddenly lurched and i was all sharp attention again something was wrong the plane was tilting sharply and the seat pitch caused the engine to misfire the motor began to sputter. There was no time to think, only time to act. I lowered the plane as steadily as I could, hoping to pancake onto the water with a gentle landing. But just as suddenly as the trouble had begun, the sparking stopped and the motor again purred smoothly. And now below the clouds, I could see the coast of France. My fingers still numb with cold, my heart still pounding from the sparks. I didn't even look for Calais, but brought the plane to land on the sandy beach. It was all over so quickly. It was scarcely 7 o'clock a.m., and I had come so far. A crowd of French fishermen and their families rushed over to greet me, the great fish fallen from the sky. The women hoisted me aloft once again in triumph while the men pushed my plane up the beach, away from the rising tide. It was a wonderful welcome. Best of all, one fishwife set up a table right there on the beach and sat me down to a good hot cup of tea. As I warmed my hands around the wide, thick, steaming bowl, I could see the headlines already. American woman flies over the channel. And it might have been so. It truly might have been. But it was April 16, 1912. And for that day and for days afterward, there was other news that eclipsed mine. But it didn't matter because I knew I had done it. I'd had my time in the clouds, my time surrounded by blue, and that was enough for me. The end.